chocolate. Um, and sorry, there is no wine or chocolate. But nevertheless, you're going to learn something about them today. So, but first, let's talk a little bit about me. So, I actually, I lived in Seattle for 10 years. Uh, I did my uh, undergrad here at the University of Washington. You can see this here, my UW there. Um, I actually have a BS in biology from UW. Uh, we don't need to know the year that I graduated. <laughs> um, but after that, uh, I went and I got a, actually I was going to be a middle school teacher. And I decided that that was kind of terrible. And so then I went and I got a, I said, what am I going to do with my life? I guess I'll go be a computer scientist. So I went and got my master's in computer science uh, from Santa Clara in the Bay Area. And that's where I live now. I got that in 2012. So I've worked as a software engineer for about the last six years since I graduated. And I've always worked on distributed databases. Somehow that became my passion. I think I've worked on four different distributed databases. Um, I've worked at Lockheed Martin, HP, Teradata, uh, a startup called Estgen. I'm also, uh, and now I'm a developer advocate for Datastacks. So I'm an Apache committer and PMC member on a project called Trifodian. It is a SQL on HBase uh, solution. And I did all the in initial installation and deployment work for that project. And then just my fun things about me is that I love Disney, I love the cloud, I love dogs, Linux, and obviously distributed databases. So what are we going to talk about today? So first, what problem are we really trying to solve here, right? These are the important questions. Can I use a clustering machine learning algorithm to find which wine came from which vineyard, OK? And then can I use a classification machine learning algorithm to find which country a candy bar comes from, right? Think about like, a, what is it, a Mars bar? Those come from Europe, and M&Ms come from America, like that. So but first, before we get into that, we're going to talk, we're going to do an introduction to Apache Cassandra. I know this is Seattle scalability. This is probably something most of you are very familiar with. So we're just going to do a brief introduction to these things. Uh, a very brief introduction to Apache Spark. Again, probably this crowd knows this like the back of their hand. But we're going to do it very quickly just to make sure we're all on the same page. Then we're going to talk about why are we talking about Cassandra and Spark together with these machine learning uh, algorithms. And we're going to bring that all together. What is k-means? because that's going to be the machine learning algorithm we're going to use for our clustering. And then we're going to talk about naive bays, which is what we're going to use for classification. And we're going to use that on our chocolate. We're going to have two demos with that as well. So again, the problem we're really trying to solve here, can I use machine learning with Apache Spark with wine and chocolate? And yes, you can. But the main goal around this for me is what I'm trying to convey to all of you is that data analytics doesn't have to be complicated. A lot of times you're seeing these types of things, and it's always on very complicated use cases. But if you just scale it down to something simple, you can learn how to use it, and then go off and do your complicated use cases from there. So we're going to use and analyze the power of big data using Apache Cassandra, Apache Spark, Spark Machine Learning Libraries, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, and Python. That's what I'm going to show you in the demo. So let's talk a little bit about Apache Cassandra. So it was developed by Facebook and, uh, and donated into the open source communi community around 2008. And then it graduated to a top level project in 2010. Now, I was actually with, a, like I said, an Apache project that went from incubation all the way to graduation. And I can tell you what a strenuous <laughs> process this actually is to actually get your uh, project committed and uh, graduated to top level. So because of that, you know that this is a product that the community has really gathered around and are supporting very strongly. Uh, the Apache Foundation is very strong on that. Um, so what it is is a distributed, decentralized database. It's elastically scalable. You can add and remove nodes with no downtime. It has high performance. It's very fast. It has high availability and low fault tolerance. There's no single point of failure. I'm just going to let that sink in. That's one of my favorite things. Uh, and one of the reasons I actually came to Datastax, because once I learned a little bit more about it and why it truly does have no single point of failure, I was on board. Because all the other products I'd ever, ever worked on had the opposite of that, like a million points of failure. So this is very exciting for me. And it solves many of the problems faced with traditional databases uh, for certain workloads. Right? When we're talking about NoSQL, it has its place. Relational database, it has its place. Right. So what does this all mean? So let's talk about four big topics in the NoSQL or Apache Cassandra space. Distributed, replication, elastically scalable, and high availability. So distributed. Every node in the cluster has the exact same role. So I put here, really. That's actually true. 
uh, Cassandra does not have a master worker architecture. So any client can connect to any node, and all nodes are read and write ready. But this is not to say that all nodes contain all the data, right? That just doesn't make sense. So that's when we're going to talk about replication here. So to be able to survive a node going down, uh, the, da the data obviously needs to be copied because we're talking about a distributed system, right? It needs to be copied to the other nodes. So the replication factor, how many times your data is going to be copied, uh, is actually set by the user. Right, so maybe if you're working with um, data that you don't really mind if it were to be lost, right? maybe some IoT sensor data, something like that, that if I lose one node of you know, a couple hours worth of data, I'm OK with just losing that. That's fine. I can just have my replication factor set to 1. If I have uh, incredibly important data that I can't, I can't stand to lose, then maybe I would set it all the way to the number of nodes that I actually have in my cluster. We don't really recommend that. It's kind of overkill. Uh, probably just three copies of the data is probably plenty. So the data is asynch asynchronously replicated across the nodes. So that's automatic, and it's peer-to-peer, -peer and it's really within milliseconds. So elastically scalable. So as you add more nodes, uh, the performance actually will increase linearly. Uh, you can scale up and scale down with no downtime. You don't even need a restart, which is actually really surprising to me and, and pretty cool. <laughs> Reads and write both scale linearly. So this is just actually just a little graphic from Netflix showing that as they added more nodes, they were able to have more um, client writes. So let's talk about high availability. So again, this lack of single point of failure, this lack of a master node allows for high availability because there is, and that means there's no single point of failure. So replication allows nodes to fail and data to still be available, right? Because now my data is distributed across nodes. If I lose one, I'm still good to go. So Cassandra expects nodes to fail and it doesn't panic. So multiple data center support is also right out of the box, even uh, multi-cloud support. So I just always like to bring this up because I'm an engineer and talking to other engineers. So we've talked about a lot of magic, right? Cassandra, Apache Cassandra seems like it's kind of magical, but there's got to be some kind of trade-off, right? And so that's what I like to bring up because I don't want to sound like I'm trying to sell something that maybe isn't true. So um, you should definitely check out this, the CAP theorem. It basically says that at any one point in time, if you have a network failure, you can only have so many of these things at one particular time. You can either have, you can have availability, consistency, and partitioning. Those are the three things, but you can only have two when you have a network failure. So because of this, it's impossible to have all three during a network failure. Cassandra chooses to be eventually consistent. So eventually consistent means it does not have acid transactions. And that's for Apache Cassandra and really any NoSQL database. So you can prioritize consistency over availability. These are things that are actually tunable uh, by you. So this is just kind of why you might need Cassandra if you have big data, you, have, you need high throughput, high availability. So we're going to do a really brief introduction to Apache Spark. And then here very soon we're going to be wrapping this all together of why we're talking about these things before we start talking about machine learning. So Apache Spark is a unified analytics engine for large-scale data processing. OK. <laughs> so right, so we have our data stored in Cassandra. And then we can do analytics on top of it using Apache Spark. So it's 100 times faster than Hadoop for analytics. And it utilizes in-memory processing to get that speed. So we're going to be using some of the Spark ML lib uh, libraries. And so those are located there. There's also Spark uh, SQL, Spark Streaming, GraphX, and Spark with R. So then what is DataStax Analytics? This is where we're wrapping this all together. So just a quick word about this, because I just want to mention it, because this is actually what I'm going to be doing the demo with. It's actually installed here just on my laptop as a single node. So with DataStax Analytics, you have Spark and Cassandra combined together. So you're not having to move the data that you have stored in Cassandra off into another Spark cluster. They're co-located on the same node. So you have uh, Spark executors and Cassandra um, all located on the same node. They're just not in the same JVM. So on each node, you'll have your Cassandra and the connector and then into Spark. And that's where you can do use your Spark ML lib. All right. So now we kind of have an understanding of where our data is going to live and how we're going to actually be able to run these. So now let's talk about what we're actually going to run. So what is clustering? So clustering algorithms are, it's pretty much just as, 
simple as what you would imagine, right? Um, it's basically trying to group certain things into um, clusters or um, groups, right? So it's the task of actually grouping these objects into, the sa into different groups. So, and you want the things to be in that group as similar as possible. It's pretty straightforward. But so then what is k-means? K-means is an implementation of these clustering algorithms. And it's basically, it's very simple, unsupervised learning algorithm that's used to solve clustering problems. So it uh, follows a simple procedure of classifying a given data set into a number of clusters defined by the letter k. So you actually define how many clusters you want before you start running the algorithm. Uh, so it's fixed beforehand. So with k-means, it's not, it's not going to determine the number of clusters that you have. You're telling it, I want these number of clusters, and then classify my data as such. And hopefully this will become a little bit more clear as we walk through the demo. So the clusters are positioned as points, and all observation or data points are associated with the nearest cluster. Right? They pick a point, and then they try to assign each one to fit the centroid of those clusters as closely as possible. So, and then just it iterates over time. So, uh, when would you actually use k-means? Like, why would this be something that you want to do? Uh, it's pretty simple, right? If you want to find, it's an unsupervised learning. So, imagine this is not data that you already have labeled with a group. You're trying to label it with a group. Um, so this can have good business assumptions around, uh, like say if you're trying to figure out uh, buyer behavior by segmenting them into a particular group or finding anomalies. All right, so let's get to the demo. So can I use clustering uh, machine learning algorithms to find which wine comes from which vineyard? All right. So, of course I'm here at the bottom. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And this is all available on GitHub, so if you can't see it so well now, uh, you can definitely just go. It's, it's all here on my, oops, it's all here on my GitHub. All right. So we're going to use this. This is just a Jupyter Notebook. We're going to be using Apache Cassandra, Apache Spark, Python, this Jupyter Notebook, and K-Means. And this is a real data set. It's available here. Um, you can just go and pick it up and use it for this. Um, so what are we trying to learn, right? Using the qualities of the wine, can its vineyard be determined? Can we find its cluster? So these are just some Python packages that I need to import, so I'm going to do that. And this here is something just a little funky. It's essentially when we're going to be using some scatter plots uh, to look at the various clusters. And so what you can do is you can, you can create a scatter plot, but you have to actually tell it to display, and that's what that's doing there. So let's run these. And this is just a nice function um, to show just like our data frame in a nice pretty format. All right. So first what we're going to do is we're going to take that data set, we're going to load it into a table. But before we do that, we need to connect to our cluster. And we're going to create a key space. So in Apache Cassandra or Datastax, um, instead of like a schema or database, it has uh, a key space. And so I'm just going to create it here if it doesn't already exist, and it's called wine and chocolate. So uh, in this case, don't really worry too much about this, but this is just our replication strategy. So we're just going to do a simple strategy and with a replication factor of one, because I just have a single node here on my laptop, right? It's not a cluster. But this is what I was talking about before. This is if I had a proper cluster, I'd set it to three. So I'm just going to set the key space so I don't have to um, worry about that anymore. And then we're going to create a table called wine. So I don't want to get too much into Cassandra data modeling, um, but we do need a primary key. So this primary key is how our data is actually going to be distributed across the cluster. Um, and so what I'm going to do, it needs to be unique. So I'm just going to generate an ID, and I'm going to use that to partition my data. So I'm just going to create a, an ID called wine ID. So this will result in an even distribution of the data, but you'll have to utilize the primary key when you're using, doing your where clause. Which, again, we don't want to talk too much about data modeling, so I'll just show you that below. But so I'm basically, I'm just creating the table off of all these columns here, and I'll run that. So which are the, so there's 15 columns here of the different attributes in each one of these wines. So I don't want to go over each one of them, because it's a lot of things to, to talk about. But essentially, we have our wine ID, which we just created randomly. Uh, it's just a random number. 
Then we have our cluster. This actually, remember we've been talking about with k-means that it's an unsupervised learning? Well, this actually, um, we actually do have the labels. It is, it is a supervised learning. Um, so because of that, we can actually do some nice comparisons to see if we're actually getting kind of the results we were expecting. So we're, we're not cheating because you may, this very well may happen to you when you have this type of data set, uh, but it's just interesting to see. So here we have basically three vineyards. We have vineyard one, two, and three. And it's, like I said, it's already been labeled in the data set. Then we have like alcohol content, uh, malic acid, things like that. Things that are making up the properties of the wine, of the plant that grows in that vineyard. All right. So then we're going to actually load that from the CSV, which was so nice in the CSV file. I didn't require any pre-processing. I was just able to load it just straight away. Um, I'm just iterating through and doing an insert. I could have also like used like a bulk loader or something like that, but just for the sake of this, because it's a small data set, I just looped through and loaded it. All right. So then we're going to do a select star just to ensure that we actually loaded the data. This is what I was talking about before where we need to utilize that where clause. So I just picked a random ID that I know I had generated to make sure that it was there. And it is. All right. So now we're actually time for Apache Spark. So what we need to do, again, because I'm using Datastax Analytics where the two are co-located, I can just build a, I can get a Spark session here. And then from there, just using this one line of code, I can load all that data that's in my table in, in Cassandra and actually load it into a Spark data frame. And so that's all this line here is doing. So once I do that, I can just do a count on the table to see that all of my rows from my table went into my data frame. And they do. I have 178 rows. And so I can just do a show on that wine table. And again, we're just kind of seeing, again, that wine ID and all these properties. And then I just want to highlight this is the cluster here by the vineyard. So let's visualize, oops, let's visualize this data with a scatter plot. So in this case, what we're going to do, our x-axis, because we're trying to find a unique data point for each wine, right? So in this case, we're going to use on the x-axis the alcohol content and the protein on the y-axis. You say, why are we doing that? We're just doing that to make sure that each point in each wine is unique. So these are just two easy ones to make sure it's unique, but we probably could have chosen other properties as well. And the color of the dot will be assigned based on if it's a cluster, on uh, the cluster that it belongs to, basically the vineyard. So, and we're just trying to make sure they don't overlap. So let's create this scatter plot here. Okay, cool. So straight away, we're seeing three clusters, just like we imagined, right? So here in blue is vineyard one, here in green, and I apologize to anybody if uh, we have any issues with seeing the difference between red and green, because this is kind of difficult to see. But uh, cluster two is green here, and then vineyard three is in red here, here at the bottom. So we're seeing those three clusters. All right, so let's actually see if k-means will give us the same output. That's what we're looking for, right? So again, it's an unsupervised learning algorithm, and it's used to solve clustering problems. So what we need to do with k-means, um, it needs to have uh, your, your uh, columns, the elements in the row, you have, it, when you're using it with Apache Spark, you have to make it into a vector. So we're going to assemble our vector here. And in this case, I'm just going to add all of the columns that were available to me, um, except I'm going to remove the cluster, the cluster column, right? We don't want to, it doesn't mean a whole lot, and we don't want it swaying anything in the data or in the result of the data. And then I remove the wine ID because that's just something I generated. It doesn't actually have any properties uh, with the wine. So then we'll just create a new data frame based on it now being a vector. So then here, this is actually where we're going to start doing the k-means and building our, our model. So we're going to set the k here. Remember, we talked about the number of clusters that we wanted to create to three. And then we're going to fit the data and generate our model. So one of the downsides of k-means, even though, I mean, look how easy this is. It's just two lines, right, of building this model. One of the downsides is when you, you have to set that clustering in advance, and because you do that, k-means is happy to just distribute your data just like you told it. So if I said separate this data into six clusters, it'll do that, even though I know, because right, this is just a pretend data set, that there's really only three. But it'll happily do that. So you just, again, data science is an iterative process, right? Uh, so you just keep going back through until your results are making sense. 
So then we're just going to transform um, our training data set with our model and get our predictions. So here I can just show some of the predictions. Let me run this again. OK. So here we see our original cluster. And over here we see our prediction. So like in this case, in this first row, we see cluster 3, but then prediction 0. Now don't be alarmed. This may, this may be wrong. And, and wrongly classified, or like it doesn't, the prediction has no idea what the labels are actually called. So three could be zero, three could be two. Um, that's a little bit confusing, but nevertheless. So what we can do here is just to try to get like an eyeball on it. There's a couple different ways that you can try to verify this when you do have a, a supervised learning situation like here. You can do a confusion matrix or a matching matrix. In this case, I'm just going to do different things. I'm just going to do a count on each one of the predictions versus our original cluster, see if they kind of line up just by this quick eyeball, right? This is just a demo, right? So let's just quickly eyeball it, see if it looks the same. Then maybe we got good results. And then I'm going to do another scatter plot. So then we can just quickly see if it looks like our original scatter plot. So if we do a group, uh, we do a count here. Actually, the numbers are not looking, not looking too bad. Look like it's lining up pretty nicely. But let's look at our scatter plot and see if it's the same. Okay. So in this case, we're seeing here in the green, which it labeled 1, which in our case was uh, Vineyard 1. So they happen to have the same label. Uh, it seemed to classify that pretty well. Seems like it's able to determine clusters um, from Vineyard 1, the wines there, pretty easily. But here on this uh, Vineyard 2 and 3, it's kind of struggling. I don't know if you can see that so well in the back, but it's kind of struggling there. So again, um, one of the downsides of k-means is that the more variables that you add, the more difficulty it has in actually uh, determining the clusters. So let's see how we are doing on time. I've run through this a couple of times. Uh, but basically, essentially, what I'm doing is I'm starting to strip away uh, things that I don't think are necessarily going to add to the clustering. right? So maybe the alcohol content. Maybe that's not going to affect uh, the wine and which plant it comes from. Or maybe the ash or the color. So I'm going to remove those and then run it again and then see if that affects it. So just because I want to make sure that we can get to our next uh, demo, I'm going to skip. I did two of these here. The, the results are it didn't work so great. <laughs> uh, so let's move on to the last one here because that was kind of the winner. So OK, let me move down to the last one. OK. So the very last one here I decided to do, and actually it's kind of funny because I got that first set of results. I mean, this when I was really doing this, I got that first set of results. They didn't look so great. So I thought, oh, you know what? I'm going to remove it all the way down to just two variables. I'm going to remove it to just the variables that we're actually using in the scatter plot. Let's see what that will do. Well, that was actually our winner. So if I just use the alcohol content and the protein in the wine, and I put that into my, uh, I, vec I do a vector of that, then I train my model and do my predictions. Okay, And then I do my counts. OK, my counts are lining up pretty well. If You just kind of eyeball it. And then I do my scatter plot. And boom, straight away, you can see it's clustering it perfectly, just like how we originally had in our original clusters. So that was it. The wine, the alcohol content, and the protein content are really the elements that make it, you can shoot, know which wine belongs to which vineyard. So again, just kind of a reminder that data science, again, it's, an, it's analytics, it's a science, it's an iterative process. It's all about hypothesis, testing, and analysis. All right, so let's go back here. So now we know how to classify wine into various clusters. And so let's talk about classification. So classification, again, just like clustering, it's pretty straightforward of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to identify a set of categories. Um, so if we train our data set on some known categories and how they're labeled, that when we have new ones, we can also, um, we're going to be able to predict those based on the training that we've done. So a good example of like classification would be um, like in our spam in our, in our email inboxes, right? Spam versus not spam. So it's basically a pattern recognition, right? So sorry there's a lot of text on this, but naive Bayes, uh, or naive Bayes, I always say it wrong, uh, is a simple technique for constructing classifiers. 
So you're going to uh, you're going to generate a model that assigns class labels to uh, various problem instances. That's kind of some fancy language for, in our case, the rows of data, right? So there's actually many different algorithms that have been implemented uh, for naive Bayes, uh, but they all assume kind of the same set of things, which is the value of each particular instance feature, right? So in our case, like the columns in our row of our of our item that we're trying to classify, um, are all independent. OK, so now we're going to go to our second demo, which is Naive Bayes and Chocolate. So can I use a classification machine learning algorithms to find which country a candy bar comes from? Ooh, that's the end. OK, so let's switch to that now. OK, so we're going to do the same thing, same kind of thing. So I'm going to go walk through this one a little bit more quickly. Um, so again, if I have some information about a chocolate bar, can I predict which country the data uh, that it, the chocolate came from? So again, this is a real data set. Uh, I found it on Kegel. Um, but also, it's, it, again, it's not only is a real data set that's out there on, on the internet, but it's actually real data. Um, it's the Manhattan Chocolate Society. They actually maintain this data set. Yeah, right? Who knew? <laughs> So I just have a caveat here. Because this is an actual real data set, this is not a demo data set, um, the results from this data set are not crystal clear. Right? Normally when I do demos like this, I generate my own data so that way I can get these nice you know, 90% accuracy. Uh, right? It looks real slick. But this is actually real. So we're going to see that when you're working with real data, sometimes you don't get those crystal clear answers that you're looking for. Uh, OK, so we're just going to do our imports here. And again, we're using Datastax Analytics underneath, under the hood, as our back end. We're going to connect to our database, create our key space. And again, we're going to create a table of our chocolate table. Same, same way we're going to partition the data in Cassandra by our primary key. Again, I'm just the same kind of thing. I'm just making it a chocolate, I call it chocolate ID. OK. And so in this case, we have way less columns than we had on the wine. We have our chocolate ID. We have our company. So that's like the company, uh, the name that actually produces this chocolate bar. We have the bar location, uh, like where the specific bean that created this chocolate, where it originated. We have this REF ID. Uh, it's not really important, but essentially what the higher number it was, the more recently the chocolate bar had been rated. Um, then we have the review date of when it had been rated. The Coke. Uh, Cocoa percentage, so the higher that value, right, 70% cacao, 60%, right? Then we have our company location. That's going to be the key. That's what we're actually looking for. That's the manufacturer's base company. Then we have a rating on that chocolate bar, anywhere from 1 to 5, 5 being, you know, it's an awesome chocolate bar. We have the bean type, like the actually variety of the breed of the plant, and the bean origin. So again, like where it's on the geolocation of the world, right? Okay. So now we're going to load this CSV file. So in this case, this was not like the wine data set. This data set was actually very ugly. I had to do quite a bit of cleaning, uh, removing a bunch of things. Um, it was not prettily comma separate delimited, right? Um, so if anyone's interested in this data set, I actually do have it all cleaned up uh, and able to use. And I have it on my GitHub. So I call it chocolate final, because it's the final one that's finally clean. And you can even see here, I'm still doing a little bit of cleaning. Uh, it's still not perfect, but right, there's only so many hours in the day. So what I'm going to just loop through each row and then insert it into the database. Then I'm going to do a select star just to validate that it's actually there, which it is. OK, so same here, what we're doing. So we're going to create that Spark session. And then we're going to connect to our table and then create a data frame from that table. So we've moved our data that was living in Cassandra into Spark into a data frame so that we can use machine learning on it. So in this case, we have uh, 1,700 rows. And I'm just going to do a show here. Again, we can see the chocolate ID, the company location like USA, New Zealand. Also, because this is a real data set, you're going to see a lot of misspellings. Uh, you actually can't see it here, but the whole data set, instead of France, it says face. <laughs> just go with it. So because we're using, again, this is different than k-means. We're using naive Bayes. And so we need to be able to split our data set into a training and to a testing data set. So what we're going to do is we're going to split it 80-20. So we're going to put 80% of our data into our training set and 20% into our test set. 
So we do that, okay? So that, that seems like 80-20 split. So Naive Bayes, again, is a classifier algorithm, and we need to predict a label. Um, we need to tell it which label that we're trying to predict on, so that way it knows, right? So uh, a couple of things. Each of these, to be vectorized, needs to be a float. It can't, uh, if for, with uh, Spark, some actually Naive Bayes that I've used on other products uh, actually could take in text input, but this cannot. So because of that, um, I'm going to need to take, uh, because the bean origin, like the, uh, where it was actually grown, that's a like, text. So we actually need to create a float based on that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this string indexer. And it's going to be each time it sees a new instance, it's going to give it an ID. So it's basically taking our, our text and making it into a number, right? a number identifier. And in this case, every time I see a new one, so after a certain point, it'll say if you, you keep seeing new instances, uh, maybe I'm just saying, okay, that's enough. I don't need, I don't need a thousand different indexes uh, for this. But I'm saying, yeah, go ahead and do that. I'll take a thousand. That's fine. So uh, again, I'm just transforming this uh, into my data frame. So I'm able also to do for my company location. That's the ultimate label that I wanted to label it with. And again, uh, same thing with the k-means, it actually needs to be vectorized. OK. So here we can see, let's see, our company location. Oh yeah, now you can see it, face. So face has been labeled as 1. So every instance of face is now 1. And we need to do this for our test set as well. And we vectorize that. All right. So now it's actually time. So now we've just been doing all this prep to get it into the data frame. Now we're done. Now we're actually able to use Naive Bayes. So I'm going to set this up. I'm going to fit the model with my training data, uh, fit the model with my training data and get a model. Then I'm going to use that model and I'm going to put my testing data and score it off of that model to get my predictions. So let's run this. And then I'm going to show that. So here we have our, so in this case, face. So, uh, so that's one. So if we go over here to our prediction, okay, straight away, we're seeing it was not able to predict that. It's giving it a prediction of 12. But so let's take another look here. So we can see in this, uh, it actually wasn't able to predict it at all. Anywhere where it was France, it's not the same. Oh, actually, USA, it was able to predict that correctly. OK, great. So now, because of this, we can actually use a multi-classifier uh, evaluator to give us our percentage of how, how well we were actually able to score this model, because we do have a training set, right? So let's run that. All right. So we got our test accuracy was about 20%. So 20% of the time, if you know the, the cacao percentage, where the bean was grown, and the rating, we can figure out which country of origin that the, the candy bar was actually produced. So it's not a great value, right? You'd like to see 90%. Right? Uh, but this is a real data set, and so I wasn't able to do that. Actually, originally when I had started working with this data set, what I wanted to show you was I wanted to show you if I knew all these things about the, bar, the chocolate bar, where it was produced, the rating, how much chocolate, you know, cocoa percentage, that I could determine the rating. I thought, oh, that'd be really interesting. That's how we'd know if it was a good chocolate bar or not. But actually, the, that uh, test set accuracy was just, it was really bad. It was horrible. So I said, okay, I'm going to go with this because at least I'm getting 20% here. All right. Okay. All righty. So we're wrapping it up. That was awesome. But now what do I do? So again, like I said, this is all on GitHub if you want to take a look at it. Uh, if you want to learn more about Cassandra or Spark, uh, so we have DataStacks Academy. Um, it's free online that you can um, utilize to learn more about Cassandra and DataStacks. And you can follow me on Twitter. I, uh, I post a lot of just the stuff that I'm doing, and sometimes I try to post interesting things. <laughs> and thank you. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. It was kind of a lot. <laughs> I did, yeah. Yeah. So um, for data stacks, 
Uh, Apache Cassandra as well, you can install just on one node. Uh, so I actually have both installed here on my laptop. I have just the open source version of Cassandra, and then I have DataStax Enterprise. And yeah, you can just download uh, either a Docker container or just a tar file and just install it on your Mac or a Linux box. Uh, I think we do have some Windows support, but not really. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't use that same uh, evaluator. I was really just doing that eyeball, right? You can also do kind of the, the like I was saying, the confusion matrix. But the confusion matrix is, is not much different than just kind of doing that scatter plot. It's really kind of the same thing. You're just kind of looking at the data and seeing if it makes sense, right? And so in that case, I was using that scatter plot to say, oh, look, it looks like it's classifying it. But yeah, I didn't use like a formal. <laughs> I don't know, actually. There are only one, two, and three. It didn't say their names. Yeah. I think it was in France, though, but I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> Face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Face. <laughs> Did you do any experimentation with picking the wrong K and seeing? Oh, no, I didn't, but that's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, it'll certainly, if you give it, if you give it K of 6 or K of 2, it'll definitely, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it actually did that. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, if you would still imagine, you, you would like to imagine that it would split it more like this, right? You know, within that, that original cluster. But yeah, I don't know because I didn't try it. But yeah, that's interesting. Awesome. Thank you. No kicking. <laughs> um, so we'll take five. This is my do that kind of stuff real quick. Uh, and next up is Sue. I'll reintroduce her again in just a minute. For the moment, though, um, remember we are going to go have a round afterwards. Yay. So stick around, <laughs> chat, converse. Uh, tell me things you want to see at the meetup in the future, et cetera. Also, did you mention Accelerate? No, I did not. Please do that. <laughs> did I mention ML for all? Oh, so many things. Oh, so many things. I lose track. So two two conferences coming up that I want to mention. One is ML for all, the machine learning conference. Stands for
tell me to start. I can't tell if that one's on or not. Can you, where are you at? There you are. <laughs> I didn't press any of the red That's buttons, good. so yeah. you can press the red buttons it if you want. It's not on yet. Oh, okay. that would be the reason it doesn't look on. Because they were off this whole time. Is yours on? Is it age? Age. Is How do you say your name shortly? You don't. <laughs> you don't? You just say Adrian? <laughs> okay. Ben. It's my middle name. Okay. But you don't have to say that one either. You just say hey. Is, <laughs> is your mic working? You're super good. Is your mic working? Everyone is noted also on the screen. Okay. So uh, just disclaimer, like I took an antihistamine last night because I have allergies and I've I was gonna like say I was gonna fall, but then you almost fell. So, yeah, did you? <laughs> so um, I might either not make sense. I've already spilled water on myself twice while sitting in the audience, so we'll <laughs> see how this goes. You know, you're describing this as you took an antihistamine. This is my daily operational status. Do you take an antihistamine every day? No, I just drop everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just especially out of it today. That's all. Did you want to say anything or like? Um, this is Suze. Okay, Everybody. cool, thanks. All right, awesome, let's do this. <laughs> How long have I got, 40 minutes? Yeah. Okay. You can talk as long as you um, want. Am I talking loud enough for people at the back? Yeah, thumbs up, okay, cool. Um, so I know this is a scalability meetup, so I wanna talk to you about a very small distributed system. You'll understand what I mean when I keep going. This might seem like a bait and switch based on the abstract, but it will actually make sense. Um, this is just like some stuff that I've been working on in my spare time, um, and it's to do with trying to find, um, I guess, um, trying to find you know a technology, um, like trying to find a technology solution for something that we've lost because of human intervention. So um, that's kind of where the distributed system fits in. So um, the official title of the talk is 200 hertz to 16 kilohertz: Exploring the Secret Life of Plants." Um, I'm, I work a lot in open source hardware, um, and you're gonna see me sort of mention some of the hardware that I'm using today. Um, I work at Microsoft, and I sort of focus on IoT. Um, I'm on the cloud advocate side, where I'm just trying to make our products better by listening to developers who complain about them. Um, but also, I get to work with a lot of the technologies to kind of bug bash them as well, so that's really fun. So I've been doing a lot of bug bashing with this board here. Uh, I also do Twitch streaming, so if you want to watch someone making typos and you know, getting lots of errors on their console, you can join me every Sunday. Uh, I stream from 9 a.m. Pacific to 11 a.m. And there's usually around 300 people that join, so it's like really, really fun. Um, and everyone points out all my typos, and we all celebrate when we get to merge pull requests and stuff, so it's actually really, really fun, so you should join me. Um, and if you want to follow me on like GitHub or Twitch or Twitter or whatever social, like I'm pretty much no up cat everywhere. So um, yeah, just send me a tweet if you hated my talk. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a story about um, plants, but it's also a story about offline devices. I think in IoT, given that the I stands for internet, we assume that all devices these days are just going to be online by default. And that's, there's a lot of different scenarios not necessarily the one I'm covering today, but there's a lot of different scenarios where um, you don't have a choice but to be offline or, or to have intermittent you know, um, connectivity, right? And so I'm gonna be talking about like a um, audio data protocol that sort of tries to address that so that we don't have to have every single device online. Um, it's also about InfoSec because when you introduce a new data protocol, especially in like what we would call in this case an open network, how do you then secure the data packets that are flying around literally by sound, right? Um, and also just like a little bit of imagination because again, it is like a silly technological solution to a problem that it's not actually solving, but it's supposed to be like pretending that it's solving the problem. Um, so last year I actually moved from New York to Seattle. And this is kind of like why this project actually started for me. Um, and I sort of was in like a really weird spot and didn't really know what I was doing. Um, it was obviously very stressful to move at the same time as well. Um, and so I ended up just kind of stuck in my house and that I had just signed the lease on. And I was afraid of people. I was very unsure about what I was going to really do in Seattle, whether I was gonna like it here. Um, and I felt like very alone, right? Um, and I travel a lot, so I can't really have like fine companionship in like pets. Like I would love a cat or a dog, but I don't. 
can't really do that. It's just not very feasible for me. Um, and so I thought, well, if I can't have dogs or cats or anything in my house, but you know, I can have something that I can sort of nurture and take care of and like maybe talk to, I could probably get plants. Um, and so this is Charlie. Uh, this is Tara. <laughs> uh, this is Violet. Uh, and this is Rufus. I actually have a lot more plants now, um, but I didn't want to bore you with all the names of them and what they're like. Um, if you want to know all about Lucy, who's my new favorite because she's a diva, come talk to me later. She's the best. Um, at night, she has these light sensitive uh, joints and at night she actually like folds up because the lights not hitting them anymore. It's like really cool Anyway, come talk to me later um, And so I had friends actually come visit me in Seattle about two months after I moved um, And I already had the plants um, and so we had this very adorable brunch in like I have a dining room now I never had that in New York. It was like a really big deal for me So we had this very cutesy like high tea and the the woman who is sitting at the bottom um, with the kind of like reddish hair um, she saw all of my plants and she saw that I had like animals and everything. I mean, there's parrots on that rug that I have. And she was like, have you read this book? And it's called The Hidden Life of Trees and it's absolutely delightful. I have the audio book, the e-book and the coffee table book of this. <laughs> so <laughs> I got like really excited about it. Um, so I'm going to just share some of the highlights that I found particularly exciting and the, the, the sort of highlights that were the inspiration for me doing like this kind of silly artistic experiment with um, sound and data. So essentially um, trees and forests and like specifically like old growth forests, you know, forests that have been around for hundreds of years, they actually all communicate with each other and not in the sense where, you know, they're like talking, not really in the avatar movie kind of, you know, way, um, but they have a way of communicating with each other through uh, both chemicals and sounds. Uh, we don't really understand the sounds, but we understand the chemicals a little bit. And so it can be as, sim as simple as like a plant is being attacked by like an insect that's eating its leaves. It can actually release chemicals through the air which, which come downstream in the wind and it can warn other plants to then change their chemical properties to be like unattractive for them to eat, for example. So that's like a very concrete specific example of how plants can communicate with each other. But they also found like some of these really, like these is some of my choice um, pickings from also researchers, which are uh, much like human families, tree parents live together with their children, they communicate with them and they support them as they grow. And so they, they will share nutrients with those who are sick and struggling, and they'll create an ecosystem that mitigates the impact of all of the kind of extremes of heat and cold for the whole group. And so there are even cases where if you chop down a tree and leave a stump, the trees obviously don't have eyes, they have no awareness like that it's a stump and it's never coming back, but they're aware that the tree is under stress and it's not doing well. And so they will send nutrients to that stump and they will keep that stump alive forever in some cases. And so the, the stump won't actually like rot or anything because it's just actually like being kept from like decaying, which blows my mind. And it also makes me feel really bad. It's like they're expending all this energy on something that we chopped down and it made me quite miserable just thinking about it. But there's also been some really cool research. Uh, Monica uh, Gagliano, she's a plant physiologist from uh, my country of origin, University of Western Australia. Um, they were looking at corn roots and they found that corn roots generated frequent clicking noises at 220 hertz, which is really weird. And they can actually like measure these like clicking noises and actually observe them. Um, and by suspending the roots in water, um, the roots noticeably lean towards like a continuous sound that they like artificially em em emitted, um, you know, in the similar region of that 220 hertz. They don't really know why, they don't really know what the meaning is behind all of this at this point, but I thought it was like super interesting. And so uh, she then goes on in her research to say, we have identified that plants respond to sound and they also make their own sounds, which like, this makes no sense to us, right? Because it's not words. Um, and the obvious purpose of sound might be for actually communicating, but that's what they're sort of looking into. So I thought it was cool that plants have this like frequency, right? Because rats in New York actually have altered their frequencies to be um, almost in the ultrasonic levels because of how much noise there is in New York City. You can't, they can't actually communicate, they can't hear each other. And so they actually all ad adapted to actually communicate in ultra um, sonic frequencies. And you can actually like, if you lower the, the pitch and um, filter it after recording them, you can actually hear them laughing, which is like hilarious to me. <laughs> um, and so there's a really good talk by Brian House about that. If you wanna watch that video, 
it's awesome, um, and I will send it to you. And it's part, partially sort of what inspired me with this as well. Um, so like there are, there are living creatures that use sounds in ways that we don't understand to communicate, and there's also creatures that communicate on certain frequencies that we either don't hear or we don't use. And I think that's really cool too. Um, and the, the other thing was that scientists also found that half of the sounds that they were actually like getting from the plants themselves are associated with cavitations, which are kind of like the air bubbles in a plant. And so if a plant is like trying too hard to um, pull water out of the soil, it ends up with like these cavitations or these air bubbles, and that's actually really dangerous and bad for the plant. Um, but these like these noises that they're making as a result of these air bubbles, they're above the human hearing range. So plants are actually having certain kind of sounds describing its um, its like state of health, and we can't even hear that happening. And it can, if you are able to actually pick up on those noises, you can tell if a tree is maybe unhealthy or if it's just not getting enough water because it's literally damaging itself trying to actually like get enough water to live. So I thought that was like really interesting and depressing too that. Plants might actually, this is like their version of like screaming, but we can't hear them. So anyway, <laughs> that creeped me out a little bit. And then the saddest thing is that um, street kids can't communicate. So what, um, so the, the book that I was talking about earlier, the author refers to um, plants that are planted in non old growth forests. So like um, suburban plants, they call them street kids, which I think is really cute. Um, so any city plants or house plants, such as the ones that I've put in my home, or just like plantations. So if they plant plants for things like cutting down for um, furniture or paper, or just anywhere where they've planted all of the plants like all at the same time, and they keep like renew like you know renewing those those kind of plantations, they don't speak to each other either because they're too young and they just haven't developed that. Which I thought was like kind of creepy and cool as well that these old growth forests, um, it does feel very Avatar-ish, right? It's like the Fern Gully kind of stuff. So, so then I thought, okay, well. How do I enable like my street kids that I bought from um, University Village Plant Store Ruinas? That's the, like the best, best, best plant store in town. I'm like, how do I, how can I like enable them to like talk to each other? And I don't mean like really talk, right? I'm never going to teach them how to like talk to each other. That's not like what I'm trying to do. But like, how can I kind of give like a t technology spin on this to kind of communicate like how sad I felt about like learning all of these things about plants? So how can they talk to each other? Like, can I take the 220 hertz and do something with it? Probably not, because we don't even know what they're doing with that at this stage. Um, but can I use sounds to communicate, you know, um, just like the chemicals and also the other sounds in the old growth forest? Um, and it was around this time that um, I became aware of this really cool company called Chirp. Has anyone heard of it? Or did anyone research it before they came? It's so cool. They have the best logo. It's really cute. <laughs> um, but. I'll explain what Chirp is. Um, so it, it has a very apt name. It's a very, like, it kind of describes the product. It's a wireless communication technology um, for exchanging data between nearby devices, but it uses sound. So you've probably heard, you know, a little bit about um, using sound to communicate in the past. So for example, if you have an Alexa device, if a TV plays an Alexa ad in your house, there are certain, like, sounds, subtle sounds that you can't hear. Um, I'm not sure if they're ultrasonic or not that actually tell the Alexa device, hey, don't react if, you know, in the next 30 seconds or, you know, however they actually do this, you know, don't react because I'm playing an ad for Alexa right now, I'm not actually asking you to do anything. And like that creeps me out because it's used for like advertising and stuff and I hate that. Um, so I think that this is like a really compelling protocol where you can actually do that yourself and you don't have to like kind of, um, you can do it for like good purposes, right, by using this technology. Um, and you can do it audibly, but you can also do it in the ultrasonic, which I'll talk about later as well. So it's really just a wireless communication technology. It uses audio to um, transmit um, data, essentially. And so you can think of some, some of the like physical limitations of this protocol already, um, but I can explain that a little bit later as well. Um, so it's actually good for like a whole bunch of really practical uses right now. Um, it's good for things like trying to connect to um, Wi-Fi networks, like basically like sharing credentials. So if you have a device like this that doesn't have a keyboard and you can't type in the Wi-Fi credentials very easily and you don't want to have to like upload it, you can actually have a script running on this and as long as your device has a, a microphone that's good enough to, to listen, you can actually program it with sound, right? 
And so you can like be sending it stuff and you don't have to have like a super fancy, like it's kind of that, that um, paradox, like how do you get on the Wi-Fi if you need to get on the Wi-Fi in order to get on the Wi-Fi? So it kind of solves that problem, which I think is cool. Um, you can also do sharing contact details. Like remember when the iPhone first came out and you had that app called Bump? Everyone was like really excited about it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, RIP. Um, so like you can imagine sharing contact details through it would be very handy as well. We're not just like, here, can you type in your email into my phone? Um, ma making peer-to-peer -peer payments is like an actual real-world use of this right now. So it's been do um, that. This is being done in uh, lots of different countries. I know that PayPal's been experimenting with this with Chirp specifically. Um, there's some cool kind of use cases that are described on the Chirp website as well. Um, I don't, I'm not affiliated with Chirp, I'm not paid by Chirp, I'm not sponsored, I promise. It's just like, this has been a really nice to use SDK, so that's why I decided to use it. Uh, and also offline device telemetry, which is what I'm using Chirp for, um, specifically. Uh, even though I love IoT, I have a real tinfoil hat um, kind of viewpoint on it, because I think that a lot of companies just don't secure their stuff. And I have no way of knowing whether they have or not a lot of the time, unless I try and like actually hack all of my own stuff. Um, and I don't think that half of the smart home stuff that we have needs to be online. I think that in order to give people who are not programmers a good customer experience, most stuff has to be online for that reason, because of just the technical constraints of trying to make something like work out of the box. But it disappoints me that so many things have to be online when that does expose a lot of risk for the customer as well if you're not doing it properly. So I really like the offline device telemetry thing and I'm trying to make, you know, every programmer that doesn't trust IoT companies always tries to home roll their um, smart home project. That's, that's what I'm doing. So this as a caveat. <laughs> Uh, a couple of strengths it has, actually, like, so you, you can kind of see what it can be used for. Um, it's good because it's robust against background noise. They've specifically designed the, um, the actual, like, protocol and, like, the way it communicates the audio to be robust a bit against background noise. Um, I also know that it has a lot of built-in redundancy as well. And I think that's what helps with the, the background noise as well. So there's, like, multiple uh, layers of redundancy. Uh, it works on older microcontrollers. Like you don't have to have a microcontroller that you know is super fancy because you just need something with a mic that can process that signal. Um, the data is encryption compatible because when you think about it, you're just um, communicating like uh, bits which turn into bytes which turn into characters, right? And so if you can encrypt the characters, then that's basically how you do it. And I'm going to show you an example of that later on. And it also doesn't rely on like constant network presence, um, which, which again, I really like because I have a tinfoil hat about it. So uh, I don't really have time to like talk about all of it, but Chirp did sponsor this really cool um, paper that kind of describes like you know the use cases and the limitations and the challenges around the protocol and like that it talks about even things like in hospitals you you can't always communicate by IRF because you're you're interfering with actual medical equipment and so this is where something like this is very helpful right so I think. This is actually a really cool paper. I can see Lita, my paper gal, is like, yes, she's my paper homie. We both love papers. Um, what I love about this too is it's called, it's, it's like super dramatic. It's like, don't assume. And it's like disruptive analysis, a thought leadership paper. So I just, I love it because it's a very clickbaity um, paper title as well. <laughs> but I actually, it's, it's written in a very accessible way. It's not like really boring. It's actually like not as academic as, as it looks. It's really cool. So what does a chirp actually sound like? Let's see if I actually have, do you know if this has a speaker? Because I forgot to ask you that. Yeah. Let me try and play your chirp. Ah, oh, there we go. So does that sound like R2D2? It does, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's what you're all thinking. I'll play it like one more time just because it's really cool. Wait, let me, let me go back. So I was going to show you code. Oh, no. OK. And what's really interesting is I try to like reverse engineer it because it's like proprietary. And so like that, those th three chimes at the beginning where it's like do, 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 like I c you can listen to different events and you can listen to when it like knows that it's receiving a chirp, which I think they refer to as the front door, right? And I think that that doing, doing, doing is the front door, but I can't, I mean, I should uh, just ask them. I'm sure they'll tell me. <laughs> but I think that's like really kind of cool to kind of try and reverse engineer. But they do have an SDK, right? So. Um, I, I just used the uh, JavaScript examples just because they're the most concise and also I probably write way too much JavaScript anyway, so that's usually what I reach for a lot of the time. Um, and so you can actually do this in the browser and that's also what I think is cool about the, um, 
the JavaScript SDK. There's also a, um, what's it called, WebAssembly library too, which is kind of cool. So you have two to choose from. Um, and so you can just create a new audio context in your browser, um, which allows you to kind of, you know, start playing cool stuff like oscillators and sound effects and things. Um, and then you connect to the, um, the uh, SDK. You create a payload by just giving it a buffer or a, a byte array, and then you send it. Like, that's literally as much code as you need to get started with, which is pretty cool. Um, and then, if you want to do things like events, like listening to state changed or unreceived, or if you want to know when you're actually starting to receive a tweet, uh, a chirp, I always get them mixed up. <laughs> you can also listen to them, which is kind of cool. Um, and so, this, I think, is from the WebAssembly one. Um, I think in order to receive, you can send with the JavaScript one, but with the WebAssembly, you can send and receive. Um, and there's also a Python example I'm going to show you later, too. I actually really love the Python SDK. I think that's my favorite one. Um, and then they also have a C SDK, which you can run on boards like this, too. So that's basically it. That's how to send and receive. It's not super difficult. So I thought, OK, um, what if I can like make my plants chirp? Like, what if each one of my plants is able to kind of chirp its current state um, to all the other plants and everyone can just listen to each other. And they can have a conversation without me that I don't understand. And that's very similar to how plants already communicate. They communicate in a way they don't care about us. They care about themselves and each other, right? Um, so I thought, what if each plant had like a specific kind of, you know, little IoT device that allowed them to talk to each other and then they could report things like, I'm really thirsty or, you know, I'm in direct sunlight and I hate that. Um, I want to be moved or something. So these were kind of my test subjects. Um, the first version of this, I really just wanted to know whether it was feasible, whether the plants could hear each other across the room. I just wanted to test this out really quickly. Um, and so I used, you know, just like a regular prototyping board that, you know, is obviously not the final form factor that I want, but it has all the stuff I need on it. So this actually does have an audio jack and uh, a MEMS microphone. And this is like called the MX chip. And I'm happy to like, um, I have a link for you at the end, but you can also come and look at it. And it also has an OLED screen. So when you're debugging, you can just like print stuff to the screen, which I love. It's better than a serial connection any day. Um, so I'm using that. And then um, the, the little round thing in the middle is actually just a very small um, Bluetooth speaker. It's designed for like phones so that you can amplify your sound. Um, and so I just use that and I can just plug it straight into the top of that board. And then I'm obviously using something that can sense like some kind of you know thing that the plant cares about for the prototype, right? So I have um, a moisture sensor. And this board actually has, um, I think it has an ambient sensor on it too. So I was able to look at that. It also has temperature and, temperature and humidity. So it can sense when like it's in the sun too because of the heat. And then I was like, well, if I have these boards and stuff and I have plants, but I water the plants and I'm worried about, you know, um, busting the board because I, I'm like pouring water on it and things like that. Like, how do I sort of um, package this up, right? So that it, it doesn't look like someone's crappy half-baked, you know, like IoT device sticking out of all the plants because I still want it to like look good. Um, but at the same time, I want to be able to protect it. And I have a 3D printer, but, um, Sometimes just like those projects just don't look as attractive as I want them to be. Um, so I thought, okay, well, houses can, uh, trees can have houses in them, right? They can have like tree houses. So what if I just designed and laser cut a tree house <laughs> for the plants and then there can be like a little tree, a little house in every plant. Um, and then I actually did seriously do that. <laughs> so that's the laser cut um, house of the first experiment. That was right when it came in the mail and I was really excited. I just used Pinoco to, to laser cut it. And then this here is actually like a little wall inside the house. And then the screen and the two buttons next to the screen perfectly line up. So if you look through the little front window, um, the screen is actually designed to show the stats of all the different plants. So you can at any time ask any plant. And like if you want to cheat, you can put it in like English words so you can read the how all the other plants feel. So you can cheat and like look through the window. Um, this is what one of them looked like fully assembled. It was way bigger than I wanted it to be just because the prototyping board was really big, but I still wanted to know if it was feasible. So that's how it looked. I couldn't get a photo of like the screen looking through the window. It just wasn't working out, but I wanted to use your imagination to imagine that look, that, that looked good. So the plan was that I had all of these tree houses and you know I wanted to put them all around the plants and make sure that they were all in the right earshot with each other. But like, how do you 
orchestrate like when they're doing it and things like that. So I came up with this schedule that would mean that I got to be part of their schedule as well. So at six in the morning, um, they all in turn take turns to like chirp. And I'll talk about who orchestrates that chirping later because that's part of the distributed system. <laughs> that's the online portion of it. Um, and so they all chirp and be like, this is my moisture level. I'm not in the sun, you know, and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, they all sync and like, you know, if you ask any of them, they know each other's stats. And then when the sun sets, um, and then <laughs> this is this is when I was an early bird in summer, by the way. Um, the plan was at 9.30 p.m., which is around when I should start getting ready to go to bed. It's winter right now, so I'm like not on this schedule at all. Um, then they would all start chirping, and then that would also remind me I need to get ready for bed. So in the morning, they wake me up, and then like, you know, like a cat does when it's hungry. <laughs> and then at night, they chirp to be like, hey, like, we're just checking in before, like, you know, it's dark and like you should go to bed, Suze. So that was like the idea of how I wanted to do it. Um, so let's talk about the orchestrator that I used um, for the first version of this. I have this uh, mother tree. So this is like, you know, the old wise tree. Um, and it's not actually a tree, it's, it's a Raspberry Pi. It has very similar hardware. It has a microphone and a speaker. And what the mother tree does is it's the one that orchestrates the chirps, right? So it asks each plant in turn, like, what are your stats? So it chirps at the plant, the ch plant chirps back, right? It has like the central repository of inf information and then all the other plants also know about each other's stuff too, right? So it, it's, a, it's an orchestrator um, and it will obviously like decrypt the, um, the chirps and then it can send that to like a dashboard where like me as a human, I can actually like see at a glance what that looks like. Um, and then it, it runs the, the actual server that I wrote the dashboard for as well. So it's a Raspberry Pi that essentially is just like running a couple of processes um, and it kind of has stuff on cron jobs that runs to do the orchestration. Um, so let's talk about what like an unencrypted payload looks like and the challenges around the payload size that you have to work with. Um, so the product, the different, um, there are three currently um, available, I guess, like protocols that they have with um, Chirp. So you have eight megahertz, 16 kilohertz, and then you have the ultrasonic one, um, which is somewhere between eight, uh, 18,000 and 20,000. I forget which one it is. Um, but you have like different payload size limits with each one, and they each kind of communicate at a different bit rate as well per second, right? Um, and so the one that I was using for this prototype gives you um, 32 bytes total. Um, and it's anything between 50 to 100 bits per minute. I'm not even going to quote that because I forget. I always forget those numbers. But I wanted a small, tiny payload, OK? That's what I needed. Very limited payload because I needed to build encryption and stuff in there. So I came up with this PL, which says I'm a plant. Because what if I want to add like other beings later? Um, the plant ID, so like, you know, uh, Charlie was zero, zero. And then like just one sensor reading, right? Like let's, let's not go crazy and let's just pick one for now. Um, so 457.3 could be the analog reading from like a moisture sensor that's between zero and 1023, right? So that's cool. Um, and then I can just split on the colons. And that to me was like both human readable, but also easy for me to kind of convert back into like separate values with like, you know, not even regex, just like literally dot split in any language. And so in order to um, protect your payloads, let's talk about that. So do you remember phone freaking and all those kinds of things? Yeah, like th this is basically <laughs> agents into it. Um, this is basically susceptible to the same things, right? Like what if someone was like, listening out my window and they're actually recording the traps and they're sending them back to make it seem like my plant's not thirsty and then like it dies because it doesn't get watered, you know, by the automated system, right? That's not good. Um, so I don't think I, huh? That's a pretty warped. It is pretty warped, warped and I don't think that's gonna happen and I'm not actually paranoid on that level but I wanted to like set a good example by like saying, how would you encrypt this? So you can use like basically any encryption you wanna do. I did AES just because, you know, I, I just don't want to muck around with stuff. But also, I ended up building a timestamp. You'll see that that second value there after the um, initialization vector is the uh, timestamp. And that means that I have a window where once I receive the chirp or the, the mother tree receives the chirp or the plants receive the chirp, 
they kind of go, oh, well, what time is it? Like, does this match up? Like, has this been played within a certain window of time that you set? You know, and the sensitivity is really up to you. But if you make it like 10 seconds or something, that, that's going to stop a lot of potential for replay attacks. So that was how I ended up building the timestamp into the payload. And then the final payload looks like that. And then obviously you don't, uh, if you know, like I'm not expecting everyone to know stuff about um, security here. I did really don't know very much, but I do know that the um, initialization vector, you don't encrypt that. So that's just pegged on to the start. I know that's going to be 16, um, 16 bytes long. And then, and then the, the actual payload is after that. And then I use the initialization vector to decrypt it on the other side. So I'm just using um, symmetric key to do this because, you know, like unless someone literally breaks into my house, they're not going to get that key because they're not online. So that makes me really happy that they're not online. So they would have to like actually reverse engineer and get the code off the devices in order to get that key, which I think is pretty cool. The Raspberry Pi is another story. That is the, definitely the single point of failure that you were talking about earlier. OK, so here is a demo of when I got the two, like this is like two plants, right? Like not in the treehouse, like talking to each other. This is the first time I actually got it working. So let's play this. And see how fast that was? As soon as that payload completed, it was like, cool. And so then it says, you know, the, the, the chirper says what it sent, and then the receiver says what it received, and I'm able to compare it for data integrity, make sure it's all, all cool. So that was like one of the first cases where I finally actually got them talking to each other. The speaker is not super high quality. It's not a speaker I would use in the next version. Um, and so I was like pretty excited about that. So this is like, if you look through the window of the, the houses, this is what you see. So you have like Charlie. So th whoever is in yellow, that's like yourself. So this would be Charlie's screen. And then Tara would like, you know, be yellow in, on hers. Um, it's just like a, a feature that's built into the screen is you have a yellow region, which is the first column of eight, eight um, pixels. And then the rest are just blue. It's actually really annoying because there's a one pixel split. If you, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll know how much I rage about that. Um, so, but it, it, I think that it's kind of a nice feature. And you can use the buttons. If you have more than one plant, you can, uh, sorry, more than one screen's worth of plants, you could use the A and the B to scroll up and down, right? So like, that's not really an issue. Or you could just have it constantly scrolling like Star Wars credits. Um, <laughs> I don't know, sorry. I'm very high on antihistamines right now. Um, so this is, you can see here that for uh, Rufus, the house is way too big, right? <laughs> so that's a problem. And that's because, you know, I wanted it to be a cube and I wanted it to house this. And so everything just got too big. The roof, the roof angle was tough. The speaker had to come out of the chimney. Um, and so this was not ideal, but it was just me going like, what does it look like? Um, so I don't know whether this played or not. Oh, here we go. So this is where I kind of got that first chirp going out in the living room. Any day now. There we go. Cool. So that's an unencrypted payload because I was just trying to like just send a string, right? And it's like way easier on your code to just de like not have to decrypt it and you just paste it out. That's the not encrypted. But it was like working and I kind of liked where this was going. Um, so I'm like working on version two, which I'll explain later. This is the dashboard I made for it. So I, I have an open source dashboard called Electric IO. Um, it's supposed to look uh, not serious. <laughs> um, I sort of want to make it friendly to people who are just getting started with IoT. So if they're using MQTT or something like that. The hardest thing after you actually start sending the data you know, successfully to an MQTT broker is you're like, but I, where is it? I can't see the data. I can't do anything with it. I, I don't know where to console log it. So I just sort of tried to make this app that is open source. You can even host it on Glitch. You can just remix it on Glitch, actually, because I have it hosted there. And so I set this up as a proof of concept of just like, let's just spray out the moisture level readings, right? It's not super meaningful. But this is sort of the, um, this is what the mother tree actually hosts on the Raspberry Pi. And then if I hit that on my local network, I can actually see that. Um, and the aim was in the future to basically take this Raspberry Pi offline and just use like a projector to project it on the wall. And then I like don't have to kind of like access it on the local network. I think that would be cool too. So it's just like completely offline. They're just chirping at each other. So that's on my GitHub at NoCat Electrico if you want to look at it. I work on it actively on my stream. I've just started working on it again recently because I'd, I'd like to give it a bit more love. So if you think that that would be kind of fun for you to look at, you can do that. So let's talk about version two that I'm working on right now. Um, smaller houses, I want them to be just like really cute. 
Um, so they're probably going to be like long, tall, like townhouses, but like not have a lot of depth, right? And you'll understand why a townhouse is in a second because it's like the, the actual new board that I chose. Um, I really need a vacation mode. I'm going on a month long vacation in uh, April and I'm not going to be home at all. Um, and I have plants like Lucy who are divas and they need like watering once a week. Um, and so I'm going to have to figure that out. <laughs> so I'm going to do uh, automated watering. So I have a peristaltic pump and I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, I want to also control my blinds and my lights with chirping. I think that would be cool as well. Um, I want to look into the ultrasonic because I'm, my sensors are usually dialed up to 11. So I think that the chirps are going to be adorable for a week and then they're going to get really annoying, right? <laughs> um, so that's something I want to look into. So I, I can't actually use this board for the ultrasonic because it only supports the 16 kilohertz. Um, and that's partially because of clock speed and then it's just that the microphone is actually not good enough. Um, and I also just want everything to stay offline, not even like a local area network because it's annoying to have a separate router that's just local, that's not connected to your online router and like just getting paranoid about stuff, it's really annoying to have to like buy extra stuff to do that. So it'd be great if I could keep it offline without um, having to do that and just use trapping. So this is the working prototype right now of like the second version in breadboard form. I chose a Raspberry Pi Zero W for the form factor for the fact that I can run higher level um, programming languages on it. I don't have to just stick with C, which is nice. Um, and you can plug most things into it. So I, I, at the bottom, you'll see that I've listed an ADC, which is an analog to digital converter. And that's because the fatal flaw of the Raspberry Pi is it has no analog um, GPIO pins. So you have to use an ADC to do that. Um, but other than that, I basically have a MEMS microphone, which um, is similar to what is on this board. Uh, an OLED screen, which is similar to what's on the board. Moisture sensor, same one that I was using, um, clipped on the bottom of this. I have a Darlington transistor and a parasitic pump together. So the transistor is just a switch to turn it on and off because it needs an external power supply. So I need to be able to like do that to turn it on. It doesn't have switches. You just set power to it and it turns on. Um, so that's kind of how that's controlled. I'm currently at the very messy, incomplete schematic stage, so don't judge me too much on that. I'm just going to skip past that, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. So I'm making like a uh, Raspberry Pi hat, which is the, the kind of like uh, boards that slot on top that you've probably seen if you've played with any of this stuff. So I'm basically laying out a custom PCB that will be um, probably ordered from Oshpark because they're great. Um, and then I'll be able to actually just put it on and then put it in the little laser cut house. So the Raspberry Pi Zero W is kind of like long and slim and that's why there'll be townhouses. So there'll be like little double story houses, which I think will be really cute. But I think they're gonna fit in the plants a lot better. Um, this is an example of a cron job that will be running on the Raspberry Pis. Again, I've kind of condensed the code and removed a bunch of stuff just so it fits on one screen. But uh, I've added a Bluetooth um, speaker. I feel like this is cheating because that's another communication protocol. But so that every plant doesn't have to have its own speaker, which is actually like really impractical, they're all going to connect to a Bluetooth speaker and broadcast and then disconnect again immediately. So this is kind of what this does. It just uses um, Bluetooth control from, uh, from uh, Linux and uses a chirp SDK. And then it kind of looks at all the different devices and finds the um, Bluetooth one chooses that to do the chirping on, and then um, it basically sends the payload, waits a few seconds, then disconnects. So every single um, Pi um, will either run on a cron job where it tweets at certain times of the day, or I will also have um, basically a daemon running, which will be Python as well, which actually listens for direction from the uh, mother Pi. So she, at any time, she can pull all of them if she wants as well. So that's kind of like where I'm at right now. The Python and Raspberry Pi Zero um, w was actually doing really well. I'm actually like really pleased with that. It was really nice to prototype to see if it was like feasible, but this new one I'm really excited about. So uh, the rest of it will be open source soon, but I just kind of want to get all my ducks in a row and actually complete it. And I, my hard deadline is end of March because that's when I go on vacation. So <laughs> hopefully it should be soon. Um, if you liked any of the technology I mentioned today, uh, you can absolutely check it out. So Chirp.io was a really easy one to remember. The uh, the data over sound white paper is there. So I should have made a shorter link for it, but um, I don't know if it's even linked from the website. I just know that I randomly found this, I think in one of their blog posts. So definitely make sure you get that source if you're interested. Um, if you want to know more about this prototyping board, which was really actually very awesome for me to play with, 
um, it's aka.ms slash mxchip, and then that's the GitHub of the Electric IO dashboard. Again, this book, if you want it to ruin your life, <laughs> read it. It's the best kind of ruins life, um, and it's delightful. And if you listen to the audiobook, they have like a British guy reading it, and like this book was translated from German. So it's like a British guy reading like the English translation of a German book, and it's delightful. And so uh, my Connect bus that takes 45 minutes every day, that's how I actually listen to the book. So uh, it was a wonderful start to every morning that I had. Um, and yeah, so this was a story about plants, uh, offline devices, infosec, and imagination. So thanks for your patience and any questions. That's it. How am I going to power it? That's a good question. So uh, Raspberry Pi is able to be powered by um, micro USB cable. Uh, I need to make sure it has at least 2.5 amps because when it runs the Chirp SDK and the encryption and the Bluetooth, um, sometimes we have intermittent dramas with that. <laughs> so that's what I'm working on right now. And then um, I'm trying, so five volt parasitic pumps are like, there's like some kind of weird world shortage of them right now, but I'm trying to get them specifically instead of the 12 volt so that I don't have to like, you know, be running up um, lots and lots of weird power drawers in my house. So that's, that's going to need its own separate 5 volt um, source as well. So each plant that at least has automated watering will have two sources of 5 volt power, but all the others will just have like 5 volts by themselves. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Yeah, but it does need a lot of power. The Bluetooth gets really fritzy if I just have it plugged into like a USB port on a computer and it can't give it the... Oh yeah, that would be so cool. Yeah, so um, solar panels are very difficult. I don't know if you've played with them before. Yeah, and like I've powered things like an ESP8266 from them and I've tried to do like trickle charge and like I just, I, at least in New York, I just never got the full sunlight that I needed. I feel like in Seattle that's going to be very challenging. Yeah, yeah. so that's a great question. I think that the Raspberry Pi just needs too much juice for a solar panel, for sure, yeah, even for a trickle charge. Yes? I have a question on the dashboard. Is that yeah. like, is it something you can see from, like, let's say, if you're traveling and you want to see how things are going? Yeah, that's a great question. So if I wanted to, I could host that um, externally, and it would still work, yes. Yeah, yeah. So how are you thinking of handling that? For example, like for some reason, if the sun is in the water, the plane Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so the question was like, how do you deal with failure, especially with things as like sensitive as if you can't water, if the water automation doesn't work, right? That's where I get a spare cut, a set of keys cut, and I give them to somebody who lives down the road. <laughs> so I will have a webcam on Lucy, because I'm so worried about Lucy. Um, she's a really beautiful plant, and I don't want her to die. So I actually will have a webcam trained on her, and I'll be able to watch that. And I know this is not like offline, but give me a break, I'm on vacation, so it's important that it's <laughs> online um, at that point. And if, sh if the water automation seems to be failing, I'm just going to call my buddy and be like, can you go water Lucy? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, the other kind of failovers that are uh, sort of failure um, things that I've thought of is just like, if you receive a chirp, but you can't, like sometimes it knows a chirp came, but it just doesn't get all the bits because of like whatever happened. Um, usually the orchestrator, like the mother tree just knows that and then it will just like call again once it's done all the others. So that's sort of the working through, I was thinking for that. It's really just like any, it's exactly the same as calling an API. If something fails, just try it again later kind of thing. Yes? Are mics not fixing all the time? You have to try to find those. Yeah, yeah, they are, yeah. So it's like an Alexa. Oh. So Alexa has a wake word, right? So it's always listening for the wake word. I assume that it's not constantly listening to everything you say, but we don't know that, right? <laughs> and again, I'm not knocking on Alexa, it's just more that this is always constantly listening for the front door. So you can think of that as the wake word that it's listening for. Which I think is kind of cool. 
yeah, so instead of Alexa, it's like bing, 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 or whatever that <laughs> front door was. Anyone else got any? Okay, yeah. Thanks. Oh, yes. <laughs> Do I have plans to expand this to trees and forests? Uh, question because uh, we, uh, we're having uh, in this area, probably not here yet, but uh, we're having problems with wildfires. Oh. So, uh, last, uh, last couple of years, uh, we had at least one week of uh, smoke. And BC had like 45 wildfires. So we were growing mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, No, I love it. I love that you're thinking this way. It makes me really happy. Someone is like thinking this way after the talk. Um, there's been some really cool um, studies that have gone into the idea of smart parks and how you can actually do those scenarios. If you're interested, there's like a cool um, kind of study that I refer to a lot uh, where they evaluated all the different kind of sensors and like what kinds of things the smart parks could actually be monitoring if you want to read about it. Um, they even identify like what cloud services could be used to run this whole thing. Um, then I can send it to you. It's, but but yeah, I, I don't have any plans to do this professionally because I do this in my spare time. The Michael Jolly said, looking at the future, how do you plan on handling the water in solenoid valve or water supply perhaps? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I have like two solenoid valves that I ordered. I ordered like a brass one and a plastic one. And they're actually really heavy and bulky, and they look aesthetically non-pleasing. <laughs> um, and so Lucy's going to have a bucket, like Lucy is on like a stool, and there'll be a bucket underneath the stool. And the peristaltic pump, you know, there's a tube on one end, and then it uses like, you know, squeezing to actually like squeeze the water through to the other side where there's another tube. Um, so that's what I'll be doing for for like vacation especially i think it's scary to connect anything to the mains inside your house where water damage can occur especially when you rent the place mm -hmm. so bucket right now and also like my living room is literally at the opposite end of my apartment to my kitchen yeah. and my bathroom and they're kind of the sources of the water so that's also just like weird to have pipes running around i'm sure my landlady would not be pleased <laughs> so so um that's a great question for now, it's just going to be a bucket with a parasitic pump. And given that she only needs weekly waterings, like one bucket would be fine for like a couple of months almost. My Lego beer train did spill beer once without me there. And that became a qualm. Yeah. Like it's, it's not good. I mean, I'm going to have like a 3D printed, um, like because the tube is like super soft and flexible. So when the water goes through it, it's just going to be like, you know, like, you know, those cartoons with the fire hose, right? So, you know, I, I have, I'm going to have like this thing that kind of clips the, the, the tube in and then hopefully bury it a couple of centimeters below the soil too, just to make sure that we don't have any weird stuff. But yeah, we're talking about like a cup of water a week. So yeah, they followed up with saying they're doing, they're doing the same thing in a planter box outside for veggies. Yeah, the outside is good. Yeah. <laughs> outside is so much easier, yeah. So you, I think that um, solenoid valves are cool, but, but you have to kind of use gravity for them, right? Yeah. So the sol solenoid valve just like works by like moving like a piston, right, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, but it basically is like opened or closed. So you need some kind of pressure. Right. And you need that pressure to be like, yes, yeah, either the mains or you have like kind of like an IV in a hospital where it like uses gravity, so. <laughs> so I'm using a parasitic pump because that's like the easiest way for me. I have one more question. Yeah. Um, if you were to apply like machine learning to your system, like yeah. would you, which component would you extend it on? Where would you, like what would you do for the model? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I know that you can run very, very simple models on a Raspberry Pi, but I know that it's going to like fall over pretty quickly, right? This is not going to get the computational stuff. Um, technically, um, there are a lot of... Um, cloud vendors and uh, IoT vendors that are coming out with like different methods of edge computing, which I was supposed to talk about more. Um, the, the 
Mother Pi is like the edge compute module that's connected to the internet potentially. Um, and so you would probably want like some kind of system that's either online to send the data up to something to process in the cloud and back down, or you can run it locally. I know that you're gonna you're so much smarter at this than I am. So, do you have anything to add? <laughs> I guess it just really. I don't have I don't have a very good answer other than it just would really depend on what you're trying to find out is yeah. what you'd end up doing. Yeah. Right? So if you're seeing some kind of lacking, you're like, okay, well, how could I want to be able to predict something? I want to predict when Charlie will need more water or something like that. That's kind of when you would you would go from there. Yeah, that's a really good um, thing because like I water Lucy once every week because that seems to work. Like I don't know if that's optimal, and I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah. just like interesting how like. You can actually like let a machine take over and look at things that I would never even consider looking at. Yeah. yeah I, was, I was just wondering like if you had thought about that and what's what's yeah. that in terms of the design. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, <laughs> there are some really cool things called like compute sticks, and you can plug them into a Raspberry Pi, and it runs all of the machine learning. Like you just basically put a model on it, and it'll run it on that, and that would be an option. And that would not necessarily affect the architecture, but it would mean that I'd be spending like 800 bucks or something extra. But <laughs> you know, it could work. Yes? If you make the curves out of I guess you can run them like every five minutes or every minute. Yeah, five that's five what's five cool. Five. And are you storing more values or like storing it anywhere? Or yeah, am I storing it anywhere? And is it still just moisture or is there still some temperature? And yeah, is yeah. Yeah, so here's the thing, like the, the payloads are definitely limited. So it would probably be like one chirp per sensor value. And I think that kind of makes sense to break up the payloads. Um, I know that with IoT, a lot of the time you just send like one JSON object. That's like, you don't get that luxury with this. Um, they're all like really good questions. Yeah, and I, I, ultrasonic is definitely next for me just because I can have it not going constantly. I like the morning and the night because obviously that's not actually annoying. Um, but during the day, and I'm pretty sure my neighbors hate me because obviously I've been chirping like for weeks, right? When I was doing this prototype and at nighttime, like in the wee hours and they must have been so pissed off at me. So just like, sorry, it, what is the, what is the stream rating? Is it PG-13? <laughs> I, I swore, sorry, I just, okay. I don't understand rating. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. Anyway, sorry. Um, yeah. So I for my neighbors as well because like I live in a um, like a duplex. So for a while I even had the Bluetooth speaker on the floor because I was lazy and so that was just going straight down. Because <laughs> like I didn't have any way to put it in my study because it's this big long thing. So I just kind of put it on the floor. So so yeah, ultrasonic would be good for not annoying neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. And the second is, how do you change the communication protocols so that, you know, like, do they want to talk at the same time? How do you solve that problem? And, uh, you know, other things you might, you might think of if you have, you know, lots and lots of labs. Yeah, that's a really good question. A summary of the question, if you didn't hear it, is how does this scale? <laughs> Which I think is a really good question, especially for this meetup. I think if you were like to scale this to 10,000 plants or a greenhouse, as you described, that orchestrate that orchestrator model would be really important, right? So like you would have one thing that asks each thing in turn s because when you overlap the messages, that's when it breaks down, right? So yeah, so scaling it means that you would need to have enough time in the day and enough, like get enough frequency of these messages because it really depends on how often do you want these reports, right? So if you have 10,000 plants, that's fine. If every, if, if every thing reports within 10 seconds or so, one after each other, then that's fine. So yeah, like time is definitely like um, extended more than like an API response that's done in like two milliseconds, right? So that's a consideration. Um, there was another one that I totally forgot that you were mentioning, like a limitation. Take the price oh, take the price down, thank you. Um, yeah, so you would basically need, you need like audio out and audio in, right? At the very minimum. Um, and so, 
the MEMS mics that you need are actually pretty standard. So you don't, for non-ultrasonic, you don't need any kind of super expensive mic. And even the breakouts that I've been using like on my breadboard from Adafruit, which is a very premium service, Adafruit, um, were like peanuts to buy. So I would say that um, I think that this is a pretty economical solution compared to other devices that need something super advanced. But I think the problem is like the speaker as well, right? Because you need that audio out. So d the, the speaker quality does matter. Um, I did sort of struggle with like bad mics for the Raspberry Pi. I needed to end up using a MEMS mic for the Pi. Like just any Raspberry Pi USB microphone didn't work. So like I definitely think that there's pricing challenges in, in the right gear for the right board. But I don't have any answers for you as far as that, as far as how to keep it down. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I know that if you produce them in China and you, mm hmm yeah. I mean, what I'm doing is like the hobbyist thing, which is throwing lots of money down the drain because, you know, I'm just ordering one, one offs because China would never want to talk to me about, you know, five plants, so. But your five plants are safe. So. Well, Lucy's not yet. Oh. I have like a month to get, I mean, she can, she can be run by a breadboard, but I'd love to get the PCB in the house done by the end of March. So that's, I'm hustling on that right now in my spare time. Cool, thank you. Thanks. I'm gonna stop because there's too many questions. Okay. <laughs>